I'm going to be on a series, yeah, YOLO, it's old, but I'm bringing it back, and we're reviving it. Um, so uh, anyways, we're going to start a series tonight. I really don't know how long it's going to go, but this is an interesting title for it, and I didn't give it to Chad, so he didn't have time to make us a graphic, but the title of this series is called The Price of Loving You, and what we're going to look at is what does it really cost God Now, you understand we serve a triune God, which means it's one God, but he's made up of three parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a triune God, one God. But what did it cost God? What did it cost God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to love you? Love in you came at a great cost. And I think when we understand truly the cost of love in us, it will empower us to return our love back to him. I wonder sometimes if the church really doesn't love Jesus because they don't really know what it cost him to love us. Now, we all know John 3.16. Uh, you know, if you watch that Netflix special, I was just talking about Tim Tebow in the championship game. He wore John 3.16. He usually wore Philippians uh, 4.19, but he changed it. 4.19 is, uh, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. He used to wear that underneath his eyes. And, uh, but then he switched it just for the championship game, the title game, to John 3.16. And it was something crazy, like 90 million people Googled John 3.16 the night of the title game because he had it underneath his eyes. Isn't that wild? It was either 60 million or 90 million. Regardless, it was a, an astronomically high number of people. And when we think about John 3, 16, what does it say? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I'm so excited that football season is back. Like there's different seasons, you know, but football season's it. You know what they have at every football game? Somebody in the crowd holding a sign that says John 3, 16. I love it. It's great. But we all know that scripture, whether we know it by heart or whether we've heard it in a church setting like this or whether we've seen it in a football game or whether we've seen it somewhere, we all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And so we know that. We know that he gave Jesus and we know that Jesus died for us. He was the, we, there was a ransom price that had to be paid for your life. Sin and the devil had you in captivity. And he said, you know, something has to be paid to release these people from captivity. I really love, I'm reading Exodus right now, and Exodus 13 does a beautiful job of painting this picture. It talks about how the firstborn shall be given, and it talks about if, uh, you know, if it's born of a donkey, it either needs to be redeemed, and if it's not redeemed, then its neck must be broken. And so what it's saying is, it either has to be redeemed or it's going to be destroyed. And that was us. That donkey represents unclean, and the lamb represents clean. And so whenever a donkey was born, a lamb had to be slaughtered in order to redeem that that donkey. So something clean. Now, what is that? It's a type and a shadow. The donkey, which is the unclean, is a representation of us, and the lamb, which was clean and perfect, is a representation of Christ. That's why when you jump over to John's gospel and you see the John, you know, standing there, and he looks up and he sees Jesus, and what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God. What was he saying? Here comes the clean one that's going to redeem all the unclean. Here comes the perfect lamb that's going to give his life for those who are ransomed and held in captivity by the devil. Here comes one who's going to pay the price so they can be set free. They can be released from the captivity of death because we were doomed for death just like that goat. That was our future. Either it had to be redeemed or it was going to be destroyed. And our path before Jesus was utter destruction. That's where we were going. Hell was our destination. But the Bible says we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He is saved my soul. Glory to God. I no longer have to be tormented. I no longer have to suffer. And I'm not just talking about eternity in heaven and hell. I'm talking about right now the devil has lost all of his power over my life. But that doesn't mean he's not going to try some things. But as I believe, I live as an overcomer because Jesus, the Lamb of God, has set me free. Glory to God. Amen. And so Jesus came and gave his life. And so we know that. But what did it really cost him to give his life? What really did Jesus do for us? I want to read some scriptures first to give us a foundation of how much this God loves you. Ephesians 5 verses 1 through 2 out of the NIV says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved you and gave. Someone say gave. And gave himself up for you as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice unto God. Ephesians 5.20, the NIV says this, or 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave, someone say gave, Gave. and gave himself for her. So I really love this because nobody forced Jesus to do this. 
One scripture says this, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. Jesus chose to give his life. And, and he walked in all power and all authority. And there was multiple times where they tried to come to kill Jesus. And the Bible says he just walked right through the multitudes and no one could touch him. So what does that mean? No one could forcefully take him. No one could make him do this. But instead, he chose to give his life as a gift. Right? And that's such a beautiful thing to understand. He wasn't forced to do this. He chose me. Listen, friends, he chose you. He chose to give his life as the ransom sacrifice to set you free. So if nobody else in this world ever loves you, just leave tonight knowing that God loves you. Amen. Leave tonight knowing Jesus loves you. Leave tonight knowing that the Holy Spirit loves you and gave himself for you. John 15, 13, NIV says, greater love has no man than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. Mark 10, 45, out of New King James Version says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, or to serve, but to serve, and to give, someone say give, and to give his life a ransom for many. So this is how much he loves us, that he's willing to give his life. And we all know that, but I want to go into some detail about it. And we're just going to look at, we're going to look at a different aspect of this each week. And tonight, what it really cost Jesus to love you is he had to become sin for you. What it cost. Now, the reason why I want to look at this is because when we think about him giving his life for us, that's a beautiful and a wonderful and a great sacrifice in itself. But in order to give his life, he had to become some things for you. And the Bible says he became sin for you. And we're going to look at this, all right? So really understand this sacrifice. We must understand that Jesus became something that he never was and something he never did. Right. So over in first John chapter one, verse five, it says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared unto you that God is light and in him. There's no darkness at all. Now, I like to read it out to amplify because it better. It lines it up with what we're talking about tonight. This is the message of God's promised revelation, which we have heard of and what and, and him and heard from him. And now announced to you that God is light. He is holy. His message is truthful. He is perfect in righteousness. Now this next part's important. And in him there is no darkness at all, no sin, no wickedness, no imperfection. No sin, no wickedness, no imperfection. In order for Jesus to truly pay the price for you, he had to become something that he was not. I want you to think about this because every single one of us as the Bible says, have fallen short, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. Am I alone up here or have you made some mistakes too? Yeah, come on, just raise your hand if you made a mistake. Don't leave me up here by myself. Some of you out there acting perfect, which you're not. You know. But I want you to think about this. Every time you have chosen your way over God's way, I want you to think about every time you did something wrong that you knew was wrong, but yet you did it anyways. Every single time you had an opportunity to do something right, but yet you chose to do something wrong. Every time you should have lived righteously, but you lived unrighteously. Every time you should have lived just, but you lived unjust. Every time you should have lived as a saint, but you lived as a sinner. I want you to think about your life and how many times you've done that over the course of however many years you've been alive. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Some of us a little bit more. How many times have we messed up and chose wrongly when we knew what was right and we could have chose what was right? Now think about your life and how many times you've done that. Now think, think about the life of Jesus. He never did that one time. Every single time there was a choice to be made between sin and righteousness, he chose righteousness. Amen. Every single time there was a decision and he had this conflict. This is what I love about Jesus. Hebrews says that we don't have a savior that, that doesn't understand us, but we have one who's empathetic towards us because he's got, he went through everything that we go through. He suffered as we suffered. These choices that you have to make every day, righteousness, unrighteousness, those are the same decisions Jesus had to make. Give into the flesh or give into the spirit. Same choices he had to make. He was tempted as we are tempted, but yet he lived perfectly. The same three temptations that we face in this life every single day, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Jesus faced that and he overcame it. He never made a wrong decision. He was the perfect, spotless, blameless lamb. So in order to truly give his life for you, he had to become something. Now, the reason why this is such a high price to pay 
It's not the cross that separated him from his heavenly father. It's not the tomb or death that separated him. It was the sin that he took upon him that separated him from his father. It was the sin, our sin, that was laid upon him that caused that separation. And I want you to think about it. When Jesus was suspended on that cross, he hung in between heaven and earth and he was rejected by both. Heaven couldn't accept him because he was now a sinner. He became sin. Earth rejected him because they wanted to kill him. And he's up on that cross. Listen, guys, sometimes we feel like we're all alone. Jesus was purely alone in that moment. All of heaven rejected him because he became sin. All of earth was rejecting him to kill him for their sins. And he's up on that cross completely by himself. This is the cost of loving you and loving me. He didn't just give his life. He became the nastiness that we know is sin. Sin that the devil still uses today to try to destroy lives. Jesus became that. Why? To set us free from sin. That's why I love scriptures like who the sun sets free is free indeed. Why, how did Jesus set you free? Because he became sin for you. A couple of scriptures, then I'm going to let you go. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. It says, this you recalled because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Someone say no sin. No. It's, under, it's, it's important that you understand this because not only did Jesus become sin to save us from sin, but he also showed us how we can live after we receive him as our Savior. See, before Jesus, you went ahead and you made all your mistakes. After Jesus, you don't have to keep making those mistakes because now you have grace that's been extended to you. What is grace? It's all the resources of heaven, amen? And we receive that grace by faith. Jesus made everything available for you so you could walk as the righteousness of God, amen. right? And so here, in, in, it says that he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Hebrews 4.15 says, well, we do not have an high priest. This is the scripture I quoted earlier. We do not have an high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weakness, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Now, I know this isn't popular in the modern day church, but guess what, friends? You can be tempted in every way and not sin. I'll say it again. You can be tempted in every way and not sin. Amen. Why? Because Jesus became sin for you. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice and atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So the sins beforehand were unpunished. So Jesus had to become sin to suffer the punishment for those sins. Second Corinthians 5, 21 out of the NIV said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. This is the cost of loving you. He just didn't give his life. He became something. He became sin. And it was that sin that separated him from his father. Imagine something that you love dearly, more than life itself, but then you're being separated from that because you're taking on the punishment of the world. It's powerful. Isaiah 53, 12, two more scriptures. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. And it was numbered with the transgressors. So Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. What are those? That's everybody that committed sin against God. Jesus was numbered with them. This holy God that you serve became a sinner. This just God that you serve, this powerful God that you serve, the creator of the universe became a sinner and died as a sinner so you and I could have life. That is the cost. Now, when you start looking at stuff like this, now you begin to understand why preachers yell at us all the time. He deserves reverence. He deserves to be worshiped. He deserves my life to be laid down at the altar before him, just like Romans chapter 12 says, bring your life a living sacrifice and lay it before God. He, he doesn't only require this and ask for this. He deserves this. 
And he's the only one that is worthy of all the praise. He's the only one that is worthy of my life. He's the only one that has given his life and died a sinner's death so Robert could have life. The cost, now make it individual. Not, we started with John 3, 16, for God so loves the world. Make it individual. God loved me, for God so loved me that Jesus became sin. Every single one of us, for God so loved. He was numbered with the transgressions. For he bore the sin of many and made intercessions for the transgressors. Mark 15, 28. And scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Listen, Jesus lived the life you could not live and he died the death that you deserved. He became sin so you could be set free. That's the cost of loving you and loving me. Now, real quick, I want to put this here because a lot of people don't talk about this. Jesus became sin so we could be set free from sin. But sin is still going to try to creep into our lives. We as believers must resist. We must resist the kingdom that we've been delivered from and embrace the kingdom that we now live in. And I think everybody wants to go through this life without struggle. Friends, that's just not true. But the good news is with Jesus, you can overcome the struggle. With Jesus, you can beat sin, and the reason you can beat sin is because he became sin. You can overcome temptation because Jesus embraced that temptation from you to set you free from that. Now listen, our flesh has desires, and we may never be truly free from those desires. But with Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we can be empowered to live a righteous life in a way that is worthy of his sacrifice. Amen? And I'm not going to feel bad if I miss it here or if I miss it there. I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to say, it's okay, I have a Savior who gave himself for me. I'm just going to move forward and I'm going to do better. I'm going to reject the kingdom of darkness that he brought me out of and I'm going to embrace this kingdom of life and light. Amen. Amen? I don't want it to be said about my life that Jesus who became sin so I could become free, that his labor was in vain. No, I want to embrace what he did for me. And friends, it's going to have its challenges. I'm telling you now, it's going to have its challenges. But every challenge that comes your way, you can overcome it. Why? That scripture we quoted that Tebow wears under his eyes, you can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. And I love that so much. Hear me tonight. You have somebody in the middle of that temptation when sin is knocking at your door, you have somebody who's sitting on the throne up in heaven that says, I understand. I get you. I get you. Just a a real quick story. My son really loves NASCAR. I don't know why. I never watched NASCAR ever. And then he was born and he was like, cars. And but there's this one race car driver, and on the side of his car, he's a Christian, and on the side of his car it says, He gets us. It's talking about Jesus. It says he gets us. And so the whole time he's driving around the track, it's just ministering to me. I have a savior that gets me. He understands my struggle. And he didn't abandon me in my struggle, but instead he said, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to take your struggle and I'm going to put it on my shoulders. That sin that you're so struggling with, because we all do, that sin you're struggling with, let me go ahead and become that sin so you can be free from it. Doesn't mean that the temptation's going to go away. Doesn't mean the desire's going to go away. It just simply means that that particular sin has been broken over my life. And if I'll embrace Christ, I'll have all the power and all the heavenly resources that have been extended to me by grace to overcome that sin so I can live free. Because it's not just good enough for who the sun sets free. It's not good enough to be free. We need to live free. I don't want to just know that I'm free. I want to live free. Amen. Amen. Jesus set us free because he became sin. That's the cost of loving us. If you would, real quick, bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I pray for every single student in here. I just pray that you help them understand that they have a Savior named Jesus that gets them. He gets it. He sees every struggle. He sees every temptation. And he's sitting there and he's saying, I struggled with it too. I was tempted just like you. And I didn't want you to suffer with this. So I made a decision to give my life and become this struggle so you could be free.
This is what I want to do tonight is everybody's head is bowed and everybody's eye is closed. If there's a particular sin that has been trying to grip your life, to grip your mind and grip your heart, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you down. I'm not going to lay hands on you. I just want you to know I'm announcing it so you know I'm praying for you. I want you to understand that you're not alone. Jesus was alone for that moment in time so you would never have to be alone again. He was on that cross, rejected by earth, and rejected by heaven, and he said, I'm completely alone up here, so my people will never have to be alone. I'll take all this sin, so even though they may struggle, they're not alone. And I'll help them in that struggle. And I'll bring them through that struggle. And if we have to work on it every day together, then we'll work on it. I took their shame. I took their sin. So they can live unashamed and live free. So as I've been talking, if there's anybody in here and you're like, man, I don't really want to announce it in front of everybody, but that's me. I've been struggling with this addiction. Maybe it's substance. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's foul language. Maybe it's sex. I've been struggling with this. And I don't want to struggle with it anymore. I want to be free. And I'm willing to work on it with Jesus. I want you to receive this by faith as I pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Every single person in this room that's willing to receive it receives freedom tonight. The desire may never go. The temptation may never go. But tonight comes the empowerment to live as an overcomer. Tonight comes the supernatural strength by the Spirit of God. So they have a spiritual grit on the inside of them that the next time they're tempted and the next time that's put in front of them, they have the spiritual grit to say, no, Jesus became sin so I could be free. And I receive that freedom. And so tonight, I say every chain and every bondage is broken in Jesus' name by the one who became sin. So we could be set free from the captivity of sin. And I speak to the shame that they feel in their hearts and they feel in their minds. And I say, no more shame in Jesus' name. No more shame. No more shame. You are his dearly beloved and he loves you. And and if he isn't, listen to me now. If he is not ashamed of you, then you shouldn't be ashamed of yourself. No more shame. In Jesus' name. Now help us walk it out. Help us every day. It's not always going to be easy. But with you, we overcome every time. I thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody in agreement said, amen. Amen.